What's going on, everyone? This is the Aggie Game Day Extra Podcast. I'm Travis Brown, the senior Texas AM sports writer here at KBTX. I'm going to bring on, it's, it's, a, it's a two shot today. It's just two <laughs> today. I'll bring on uh, Tyler Shaw over here, KBTX sports director. Tyler, how's it going, man? Uh, going well. I'm not in Hawaii, so I, I'm not going great, but uh, yeah, it, I'm fine. That's where Max is. Yeah. Our, the, the, the weird, it's simply just knowledge here. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the stupidity yet <laughs> feeling of the show. I love you, Max. Yeah. Is uh, he's in Hawaii on vacation? There's not a lot so of heart today. There's not a lot of heart today, but hopefully yeah. we'll bring a lot of smart today. Uh, yeah, See what go. I did yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. See what I did uh, there? Already off to a good start. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so bye week. What would you what you do on your your, your week off? Your weekend off? Yeah, it, it was kind of rare. Um, you know, having that the that kind of bye week, even for us. You know, not cover covering the Aggies. Uh, you know, got to spend some time with family. Uh, went up to Dallas. Got to see a lot of football and just kind of see the rest of the college football world. And I was saying the other day, after watching the rest of the SEC, I think I have more questions now. Just the league in general than I did before the weekend. Uh, it's uh, it's wild out there right now in college football. It, it makes you look at A and M a little bit differently from it, what they've been able to do because sometimes you do get in that that bubble because uh-huh. it's the team that we cover. Right. So you kind of focus down in on there and you don't necessarily know how, what, what, what you're looking at looks at compared to everything else. So a bye week is a good week to kind of see, see what the rest of the realm looks like uh, compared to what A&M and, I say it looks pretty favorable for the Aggies. When you look at the big picture, it, it definitely does. Um, especially when you look at their schedule, their schedule is favorable, and we've said that from the start that they didn't have a, a, a tough, tough road slate like they've had in the past. Um, the it's manageable, and they've done what they've needed to do so far. And when you look at the rest of the league, I mean, they are in first place in the SEC standings, you know. And I don't know who's good in the SEC right now. I think Texas is the best team right now. Um, but after that, I really don't know. It, you know, it, it looks like Tennessee or an Ole Miss was going to be there, but uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. Tennessee, Ole Miss both have major flaws. Uh, Alabama and Georgia have shown their flaws. So it's, uh, and then LSU, uh, and we'll see in a couple weeks with LSU. Um, that, that's going to be a big one, but, uh, it's just kind of weird right now. And, and I think a and has a very favorable path ahead of them. I think, you will learn a lot when it comes to the SEC this weekend, too, with Georgia and Texas matching up. Right, right. Um, and hopefully for all the F1 fans out there, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's going to be a crazy weekend in Austin. Um, I do j- just, you know, looking at it on paper and look at uh, this will be Texas's biggest test by far. Uh, I still think the Longhorns, I'll, I'll give them a slight edge right now. I think they're a little bit better of a team. Um, but we'll see. We ha- they haven't really been tested. Oklahoma's not good. We saw that mm-hmm. in the Red River rivalry. Um, say that ten times fast. No, Red River I'm not. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, you know, if Georgia has another loss after next week, I mean, man, how do you not start seeing a path to uh, to Atlanta for AM? I'm uh, looking at this camera now. So we're, we're having to set things up differently because Max is in yeah, here. he's throwing everything And off. I really should have taken your offer to sit in the taller stool because <laughs> this is, we have quite the... I'm trying to slouch as uh, much thanks. as I can, I appreciate man. it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are listening on, you know, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, do that because then you don't get to see this <laughs> lovely uh, high, height differential. Well, we, we don't really have much of... We went over our uh, players of the first half last week uh, with Max here. We kind of recap the first half of the season. We don't really have a game to look back on. I know uh, Mike Elko, Connor Wegman, uh, Torian York said that they were kind of focused eternal, internally. A lot of uh, good on good uh, matchups during practice in the week of the, the bye week and uh, able to get rested up. Connor Wegman back to 100%. I don't think that there's any reason we shouldn't expect him uh, to be starting coming forward. So uh, was there anything out of the press conferences? I know I, I was at jury duty. I didn't get to hear the press conference two weeks ago. But anything out of the two press conferences that stood out to you that uh, was of any import from the, the bye weeks? Uh, the biggest thing is uh, the, the, the culture, I think. They've talked a lot about the culture and that championship mentality and that winning mentality. And they've they've talked about that since... Uh, maybe not a cha- they didn't use the word championship and, and winning a whole lot it, back in the the summer and the off season, but they did talk about just putting their head down and going to work. And I think that's shown 
that's what they've been doing, and that's what they are. Uh, this is a very different team than what we've seen in the past, and you can tell the effects of Mike Elko on this uh, this roster and, and on what they were able to do. I also, just the fact, hearing from Connor Wigman again, um, I really like his, his ownership, his leadership, really. Uh, I think he's just kind of shown and that he is a true leader of this team. And I, and I think now is kind of the first point of the season where we finally don't have this, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a quarterback controversy, but mm-hmm. it seems like every week until now we've been you know, wondering who's going to start, Marcel or Connor. And uh, we have our answer of who the, who the quarterback is of this team. You know, Mike Elko was asked today on the SEC teleconference, kind of what's made. Was he surprised that the run offense was going to be this good? And he, he said that he knew the backs they had were good. He knew the offensive line was going to make strides this year. Um, but I, th- I think he kind of was saying, eh, you know, this good. It's a, it's, it's, it's a pleasant surprise. Um, but a big part of that he did say was Marcel's Marcel Reed's ability to use his legs and kind of open things up a little bit. Um, curious to see if uh, the change in quarterback that isn't quite as mobile, um, you know, maybe they stack the box a little bit. Maybe they um, contain a little bit better. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm curious to see if that changes anything. Yeah, that, that'll that be interesting to see how that offense. But, I mean, Le'Veon Moss is, I mean, he's a, a beast and a workhorse of a running back. He's proven that. And maybe a lot of that has to do with Marcel Reed. Uh, but when you're looking at this week specifically, uh, Mississippi State has a really bad run defense. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know if it, I don't know if it I don't know if we're going to learn anything this week about what their offense looks like. Well, going we can l- go ahead and get into all of that because the A and M takes on a really bad Mississippi <laughs> State team. A uh, and M, of course, five and one, three and zero oh in the SEC, sitting there at top of the Southeastern Conference. It's the exact opposite for Mississippi State: one and five, zero oh and three uh, in SEC play. They're playing at Davis Wade Stadium. It's a three fifteen kick Central on the SEC network for those of you who will be uh, watching at home. And uh, here's the tale of the tape. Here's what we were talking about. Uh, It's a really bad rushing defense against a really good rushing offense. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't really see the need to throw the ball a whole lot uh, on Saturday. I mean, it's just, I don't think they're going to be able to stop Le'Veon Moss and EJ Smith and, uh, you know, even Connor Wigman will be able to, you know, pick up some yards. And the, and the way Colin Klein's offense is designed, you know, they're going to get their yards on the ground. Um, and I don't think Mississippi State's going to stop them. And I will say, as bad as Mississippi State is, I've gained more respect from them lately than. Um, what I thought uh, maybe earlier in the year. Earlier in the year, I thought there's no way Mississippi State stands a chance and that Bowling Green was going to be a tougher opponent than Mississippi State. Uh, but they just kind of took it to Georgia last week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're not, you're not wrong. Uh, I, 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 this is, this is, this isn't a good team. It's, it's a bad team. A&M should handle business here. The, the, the thing that they actually do have going for them is they do have a pretty good passing offense. Um, and I know they lost their quarterback. They have the true freshman coming in. He did pretty well against Georgia. Uh, and, but, you know, you're looking at this, it's the the two, uh, 255 yards of passing offensive game. That's in the top 50. I, our graphic kind of messed up here if you're watching along. Uh, and A&M's passing, they've given up some some passing yards uh, and had some busted coverages. Um, this is kind of one of those games where A&M should handle business, but if they have a couple of those busted coverages and communication and issues in the defensive secondary – they all of a sudden could be a little bit of a game. Well, and didn't we used to see that with Will Rogers uh, when when he was running the show and carving up AM secondary? And uh, the Bulldogs might have their next Will Rogers in this freshman. He looks pretty good. Uh, but I think that is the only matchup that I guess would cause concern. You factor in how good AM's defense is been, you know, they, uh, to me, they've been getting better by week by week. Um, I, I think AM's defense combined with how well they run the ball and how Mississippi State's defense is just not good. Uh, I don't think a freshman quarterback is going to be enough to beat this team. And now we'll get a quick word from our sponsors. Let me let me tell you guys how much I love specifically the CX line of vehicles from Mazda. I've got one myself. 
Uh, it's a little bigger than the one that we're talking about today, but it is a fantastic ride, y'all. Today, though, we're talking about the 2024 Mazda CX-5. Roomy, comfortable, competitive gas mileage, and even bought at standard, they have some great features. You can get the 2024 Mazda CX-5 Premium for 0% APR for 36 months, plus 750 APR cash or lease for only $299 a month. The 2024 Mazda CX-5 Premium all-wheel drive model is a true driver's vehicle that comes with a luxurious interior and a bold exterior design. Standard features include standard all-wheel drive, leather interior, heated seats, adaptive cruise control, premium audio, sunroof, lane keep assist, memory seating, and a power lift gate. Car Drivers 2024 Editor's Choice List, car and driver included the CX-5 on its 2024 Editor's Choice List, calling it a better driver and far more luxurious than its competitors. It was named the 2023 IIHS Top Safety Pick and received a five-star overall safety rating from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Very, very helpful stuff going along with that and the standard features, including all those safety features like forward collision warning, blind spot monitoring, and lane departure mitigation. It's the 2024 Mazda CX-5 Premium. Hey, go over to Mo Douglas Mazda. Tell them KBTX guys sent you Douglas Automotive, home of the nice guy. Here's what we are going to get into a little bit more in the meat of it, and that is the fact that the a has something else working against them, and that is history. Yeah. Because they have <laughs> not been good at Davis Wade Stadium. Now, yes, it's a different roster. It's a different coaching staff. It's a different coach. They, they've gone through three different coaching staffs, excuse me, four different coaching staffs just in the time that I've been here since 2016. Uh, Mississippi State's more than that since A&M has joined uh, the SEC. But... If you uh, if you look here at uh, the the facts and figures, it's a tied series eight and eight over all time at Kyle Field. Uh, five and the Aggies are five and three, and their largest victory was last year in Kyle Field, uh, that fifty was the one infamous, to ten. Uh, Jimbo Fisher game. That it was, was his... the Jalen Henderson game as well. His first start. Yeah, his first start. Jimbo's last game and um, Mississippi State coaches. Uh... Last game, his, his yeah, last game as well. Was, they, were, they were both fired. It was a little that. bit of wild. It was the game where uh, uh, Blake Bose either you know infamously or, or not or Im not infamously <laughs> came out with uh, um, oh what's his name uh, Max Johnson's warm up yeah, yeah, yeah. throwing yes, left handed with his yes. hat pulled down oh, real low. and man. I know the 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 line the the idea behind that was that. Max, you know, Blake Bose couldn't find his. His locker's next to Max Johnson's. Max said, hey, I'm not going to need mine. Take mine. The, just that hat was pulled down so, yeah. so conspicuously it a little, little intentional. You know, and, and if Mike Leach was still alive, he would have loved it, I yeah. think, if that had been uh, a, a thing. But uh, so that was the largest victory last year, which is surprising with how last season went for the Aggies. At Davis Wade, though, here's the big thing. Two and four. Um over the last 10 matchups, A&M is 4-6, and six, and their largest loss is actually was at Kyle Field as well. This was in 2017, 35 hmm. uh, to 14, 21 points uh, there. So that that two and four at Dad Davis Wade, and there's been some interesting uh, there's been some interesting matchups in that as well because the one that sticks out the biggest to me that's kind of a parallel to this is that 2016 season. A&M comes in in the first college. Uh, football rankings of the season, playoff rankings of the season, and they're in the playoff. Yeah. And they it go out. Trevor Knight has that offense rolling with his read option. Uh, it's Noel Mazzoni's offense for, for the one year he was here. Uh, they had Keith Ford and uh, Travion Williams. Uh, he was believe, on that team. Was on that team. Uh -huh. And and uh, they, were, they were running all over the place. Uh, Trevor Knight breaks off a big run, falls weird on his shoulder, and guess what? He has an AC joint sprain in his yeah. shoulder. Enter Jay Kubinek, both guys are friends of the Aggie Game Day. Yeah, uh, we have them on the show regularly. Aggie Game Day set, and they uh, go and, and end up losing that game. They fall out of the rankings, and then it just kind of becomes a little bit of a free fall until Trevor Knight comes back in at the end of the season uh, against LSU, and, and they're able to uh, well, like I said, they didn't get a win at the end because the first win was Kellen Mond in, yeah. in 2017. So it was it was a season that had so much potential, but it was that classic Kevin Sumlin season where it's the roller coaster clicking all the way up to the hill until you hit November, and then it just absolutely crashes down. So there is some parallels in the beginning part of that. A&M is building up to what could be a really great season. The rankings aren't out yet. They're going to come out November 5th, but... 
Uh, this has the makings of a game where, you know, if there's some breakdowns in coverage and Mississippi State can throw the ball a little bit, uh, A&M's office struggles. It, it could be a trap game. I don't see it that way. But there is some interesting parallels to history, and it's a place that they haven't played well in. Yeah, I mean, I don't see that either. But, yeah, I mean, you look at the history, and it very well could be one of those kind of classic trap games. And, and I think A&M is aware of that. You know, Mike Elko said, you know, we don't have to look at what the rest of the league is doing. We have to look at ourselves. We haven't been able to beat Mississippi State in the past up there. Um, and, I, I, but, I, again, I don't see that happening. I think a lot of that was, well, this is a new culture, new team, new coaching staff. And they've already kind of dispelled with some of the history earlier in the year when they went to the Swamp and had a dominating victory on the road. That was their first road victory in three years. I think that they're going to continue to kind of buck those trends. Yes, they haven't played well at Davis Wade. Well, I think this is the year that they do play well at Davis Wade. Uh, and then a lot of that, too, I think was Mike Leach. Um, Mike Leach, mm-hmm. even when he was at Texas Tech, he kind of had the Aggies number. Um and so I think a, a lot of those factors go into it, uh, but it, it will be interesting. I could see this again. I, I don't see AM falling into the trap. I see them winning pretty easily, but I could see Mississippi State putting up a fight and it being a little bit closer than most Aggie fans would want. Maybe. Mike Leach loved beating AM. He usually <laughs> loved. He both loved AM. He did. He had because a lot of he liked the military, for, he, the, yeah. the pirate, and his his reading war books. He loved the military history of AM. He loved Kyle Field. He also loved beating AM, and he loved beating AM in Kyle Field, but also at Davis Wade Stadium. I pulled up the graphic here. We mentioned that uh, uh, two win record at Davis Wade. Those two wins came in 2020 which was A&M's best year in the yep. last decade, yep. uh, and then 2012 with Johnny Manziel at the helm. Wow, so the only times they beat Mississippi State, they had a really good team. You know, mm-hmm. it, was, they, it was never any of these mediocre teams that they had. So you got to think, if A&M comes away with a victory and you look at history, you know, are they on trajectory for another 2020-type season, mm-hmm. another 2012-type season? And this year, that means top 12, that means playoffs. Uh so yeah, this, I, I, somehow we've managed to make this the canary game uh, for the season, which is, is silly because it's a game. It should be one of the easiest games on the schedule for a and M right. other than like McNeese. But now you've heard it here first on the Aggie game day extra podcast. This is the, this is the, uh, the test. This is the elementary school test uh, yeah, honor, honors the gifted, test that gifted and, talented. gifted and talented test that Max Crawford wanted to yeah. talk about a couple weeks ago. Forget, Missouri, it's it's this game. Uh, well, if Max was in. here, he, he'd be hating this because he'd just be saying this is all rat poison to him. <laughs> I know probably. he's probably a little bit nervous as a fan going going into this game, and we're kind of writing it off as this should be an easy victory. But yeah, so uh, I I am curious about how the past. We've talked a little bit about how the defensive secondary is going to uh, fare in all of this. Um, one of the things that the defensive secondary plays a big part in, and really the whole defense is third downs. It's something I asked Mike Elko about a little bit this week because he is, like, third downs is his bread and butter. And I'm, I'm, I don't know how well you can – this is one where I can chime in because you usually can see everything better down in your perspective on the field. But just the mass line change that comes out. And it was like this when he was here as a defensive coordinator. Um, they they mass line change. They usually go to a three-down front and bring in that jack uh, hybrid – a defender, which is either Cassius Howell or, or Ryland Kennedy, uh, who's usually always rushing and getting in uh, behind. The both of them have an, a, a, for as little for for only playing really on third down. They lead. They're they're in the top five in uh, quarterback hurries. Uh, on the team or, or pressures quarterback pressures on the team because of how often they go on third down. Uh, you also bring in. Other def- other defensive secondary guys. That's where uh, uh, Des Ricks has been able to make a little bit of an impact at times. Oh, does it from the field level? Does it feel like when they get those third, especially sometimes those third and longs, there's a different. Not only is there a different team, but there's a different vibe. You can feel the the, the energy, and I, I don't have the stats in front of me, but uh, I mean against Missouri, they're every third down. You just kind of had that feeling like. Well, Missouri's not converting. <laughs> like, like, mm-hmm. like the defense was set. They came out, and you could just feel the juice. Not only, the, I mean, you feel 
you see the team, yeah, lined up differently and how many subs in and outs they have. And it's just, um, you know, all over the place with the line change. But then, you know, third down in Kyle Field with the defense, and you have the you have Mo Bamba playing and, and everything. A Mo and, Bamba triple threat. Yeah, Mo, oh, Mo Bamba triple threat. And that, I think, is when uh, at least the – I mean, the secondary shines, but the line shines too. I mean, I don't know how many Nick Scorton, um, you know, tackles for loss and sacks come on third down, but it seems like it's in those critical moments when they need it most is when – um, and, and they have all, you know, all those classic Mike Elko um, pressures, um, you know, with safeties coming down and blitzing and um, and everything. So, can, can you uh, guess what website I'm pulling up right now? Uh, I'm well. If you had to ask, it's probably Pro Football Focus. You're right. Yeah, the uh, our, our our go-to source that every coach hates. <laughs> I mean, it, it is it is certainly a tool. It is not infallible, and. It definitely gives some context into stuff that coaches don't want to talk about because it is their game plan and and some of of what they do in different situations. So it, it kind of makes sense sometimes when coaches want to dispute it or yeah. uh, talk it down a little bit. But I, I pulled up the defense, and actually this is what I was looking at a little bit earlier uh, and probably what I'm going to write about a little bit earlier. When you look at total pressures um, this season, so there is four players – with double digit total pressures on AM's team. Can you name the four with with total pressures? Uh so wait, there's double four digit. players with double digit pressures. Yeah. I'm gonna guess Nick Scorton is one of he them. He leads with seventeen. Yeah, okay. Uh I would guess does Shamar Stewart have double digits? Shamar Stewart's number okay. two with fifteen. Okay. So Nick and Shamar, those are probably the easy ones to get out. Um don't know if there's a linebacker on there. Uh, I'm not going to give you a hint. Okay. I'm not going to help you out. I mean, Torian York. I, I, Torian York has I, seven. He okay, is number I was about five. To say, yeah, I don't. I don't know if he's okay. So he's first off the list. He's the first off the off the double digits. Um, I don't think Albert Regis has been in enough to to. You're missing one yeah. more easy one. Schmar Turner. Schmar Turner okay. is number four with eleven. Cassius Howell okay. with okay. twelve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and the interesting part of that, if you look at that, so the, the the those three guys you mentioned, Nick Scorton, Shamar Stewart, Shamar Turner, they all have more than Shamar Stewart has the mo- least amount of snaps of those three with two hundred and thirty nine uh-huh. so far this season. Cassius Howell has twelve total pressures and one hundred and sixty five snaps. So that's he, almost ha- that's, that's that's almost a hundred less than Nick Scorton. Yeah, he, Cassius Howell's been very impressive. I mean, he seems to be all over all over in the backfield every time he's in there. Ryland Kennedy, who also plays that jack position and sometimes gets in those third down situations, he has six uh, total pressures, which puts him at a tie for sixth, and he's done that in ninety three snaps. Yeah, so the the, the the very efficient, you could say. Yeah, yeah, they they get it done, and just kind of an idea of what that third down usually looks like because uh, they are um, they're getting after the quarterback. They're they're used used in that rush and used in different ways. It looks a little bit more like a three four at times, where you have that kind of stand up linebacker who can go. He can go in the A gapping. Now, most of their rushes, if you look on here, or at least most of the time they're lined up, they're lined up outside the tackle. Um, so they're usually coming from the outside, but they do twists with the offensive line. They can line up in the A or B gap behind as kind of a walked up uh, linebacker. So you don't really know. You have to keep an eye on them because they could be coming from anywhere. It, it's a it's a big departure from the kind of four two five that they normally uh, run on defense. Well, and, and to I mean to that that is exactly why I think that it's not going to be much of a concern of a, of a matchup. We talked. I mean, yeah, there is that secondary everything, but and and Mississippi State's quarterback Michael Van Buren has shown a lot of promise, and I think he's going to be a good quarterback. Uh, I just don't think a freshman is ready to face that kind of pressure and what Mike Elko. Uh, excuse me, what uh, Jay Bateman's defense is going to to bring? Because I just think they're gonna, they're going to eat him alive. Uh, so, so what is the what is? Were we looking at the spread in this game? I don't know if I've actually seen it. Um, or at least seen uh, it I want to say it was around fifteen. I could be wrong. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked lately either. So I, I I think the answer. This is one of those games, and you know this could always come back to bite you with the fans. But I think this is one of those games where you say. It does does Mississippi State cover? 
Yeah, uh, and I could see them covering. Um, Spread is 15.5. Okay, see, see, I could see it being like a 34-20 type thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, if they cover, I think it's barely. I, I, I think it is a, at least a two-touchdown game. Um, again, I think they show fight. But the, especially what's impressed me about this AM team is how they've played well as the game goes on and in the fourth quarter and how they didn't let up against Missouri. So even if at halftime it's a one-score game in the third quarter, I, I think a and just puts the pedal to the metal and, and finishes strong. And I know these are just the losses. I put put this one in and put this back up, but usually these games aren't necessarily close. Either. I mean, they're they're two-score losses. Yeah. There isn't, there's only been uh, one that's been within, I believe, uh, a, a one-score margin. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think... I think I would probably take I take A and M to cover um, because I just don't think this Mississippi State team's good uh, at all. And again, A and M fans like do the Mike Elko and, and knock on wood uh, because um, the, every time I've s- said how a game is going to go, it's been the exact opposite this <laughs> season. So that probably means it's going to be a close game and a nail biter down to the end. But yeah, I just don't see this. I see them. I see A and M covering. I don't. I don't see them letting them within fourteen points. Well, I was just about to say. Yeah, logically, this isn't a close game. A and M doesn't have uh, troubles. But uh, hypothetically, if they, let's say Mississippi State pulls off the upset, uh, how much in trouble, big picture, season wise, is A and M if that happens? Yeah. If if Mississippi State upsets, um. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely out of the SEC title race, I would think. Oh, only one SEC loss, though. Yeah. I uh, see. That's the thing is, I don't think you're, you know, even if there was, they played their worst game of the season and, and Mississippi State just rose to the occasion. But I'm still factoring in, and, and I, I'm doing this for Max for not being here. I'm factoring in the fact that I don't think AM's beating Texas at the end of the year. So that's two okay. losses. Okay, that's fair. And I'm, but AM and uh, Texas are the only two teams without. A, a loss, loss right exactly. now. So, and if AM beats LSU, that gives LSU their second loss. Uh, so, and the tiebreaker. Is, is, is it kind of weird? The, yeah, it is. You, it is a weird season. Yeah, and it, I like it. I yeah. like it so much better than knowing uh, Alabama or Georgia or whoever is just you know going to cruise gonna through. Cruise through yep. And it's it's all eyes are on the title game already, and it's the fourth week of the season or something yeah, like I, that. I have no idea who's going to play in the title game. It's, yeah, it's wild, and and it's I mean I, it, it seems like right now the 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 the, the picks are to have a, a rematch of the week before. Uh, it's look uh, week eight. It's looking like that for sure. Uh, you look at November thirtieth. That is going to have a lot of implications. And you know we're looking about how wide open the SEC right now is right now. I think this is a perfect season for this 12 team playoff mm-hmm. just because I, I don't know who the best team is. I think and, really what your thoughts on this are going to be, because uh, this is the first year of us traveling together. How good of a travel uh, roommate am I? Because <laughs> then you're going to be rooting for more losses. So you don't true. have to do one more trip. That's true. To that's, Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, with me. So, uh, you know, I, a fair point. I didn't. I almost left the car keys at the stadium and in the swamp, but I didn't. Yeah, you didn't. So it take that into call, consideration. Yes, we thought happen. I might have. Yes. But they were. It was all good. I in left the them car. in the car. We could have had the unlocked. car stolen. But. but, you know, it's a rental. It's fine. Yeah. We could we could figure it out. Yeah. So, well, that is uh, all the time we have this week for the Aggie Game Day Extra podcast. We will be, Tyler and I will be out there in Stark Vegas after a nice, short 10-hour drive. <laughs> uh, and so if we look a little sleepier, that's probably why. But we'll have all the coverage from uh from davis wade uh stadium we'll have uh, live hits on friday the night before we'll have uh stuff on kbtx.com the kbtx sports app uh you can cue this up and listen to it again on the kbtx sports app or apple podcast spotify wherever you listen to your podcast but be sure to look at all those things uh because we'll have some great uh some great reporting from out there in mississippi so For Tyler Shaw, I'm Travis Brown. This is the Aggie Game Day Extra Podcast. We'll talk to you again next week. Cool, cool. I'll just...